computer programs are the most complicated things that human makes. Humans do not make anything that's more complicated than computer programs. And it's kind of amazing that we're able to do this at all. Uh, computer programs are very difficult to make. Um, um, and so there was, uh, and that was recognized very early. So there was an idea that we should employ artificial intelligence. Since a computer works something like a brain, if we could program computers to think, then they could write our programs for us. Um, that turned out not to work. Artificial intelligence has done some amazing things. You know, you know, computers can now play chess pretty well, and they can even play Jeopardy. But you can't give a set of requirements and some user interviews to a computer and ask it to write a program. That's not something they're able to do. And so we're still writing computer programs by hand. The, the way it has always been done. And so it's a very difficult, very labor-intensive process. The number one tool we have for, for developing computer programs is the programming language, which helps us to work at a higher level of abstraction, which give, amplifies our abilities, allows us to do more. And there are a large number of programming languages available to us, and one of the most surprising of those is JavaScript. One of the things that makes programming so difficult is that perfection is required. We need more perfection in the development of programming than in anything else that humans do. And humans are not good at perfection. Um, the reason it needs to be per perfect is because of the contract that we have with the computer. That if the program is not perfect in every detail, then the computer has license to do the worst possible thing at the worst possible time and will be free of blame. <laughs> All of the blame will go to the programmer. Uh, so because of this, um, there is a, an importance for us to be perfect, and we're not, and it's hard. Um, and because we know it's so hard, in some cases we don't even try anymore. So we know that we will not hold on to a program and, and refine it and polish it until it is perfect because we know it will never be finished. So instead, we release programs much too early in a very unfinished state, a very imperfect state, and just hope, which seems completely irrational. But at, at this moment, that is the state of the art. So programming, um, it, it's hard to understand how we're able to do it, because we are hunters and gatherers. There's been no human evolution since the uh, Paleolithic age, so there's no explanation for why we're able to do this. Um, we use the head, obviously, because um, programs are about managing state, and we keep all that state and all the relationships and all the models in our head, and you have to keep it there in order to, to render something into a program. But we can't actually describe how we write programs. There's not an algorithm which says how we do it. You know, some, partly we're doing things bottom up, sometimes we're doing things uh, top down, sometimes we're doing things inside out, outside in. We're constantly changing our strategies as we're um, honing in on how to express a problem in terms of something which can be executed by a computer. We don't know how we do that, but we do it and it's amazing. And I think maybe it's because of the gut, that there's something about how the gut works in relationship with the head, which allows us to have these amazing flashes of insight which make programming possible. So we could not program without the gut. Now I have absolutely no evidence to support that statement. <laughs> But my gut tells me it's true, so I believe it. <laughs> now, one of the things that makes programming difficult is also the gut. Um, the gut cannot do arithmetic, and it is very confused about numbers. The gut considers a lot to, be, to have a greater weight than all, and it considers not very much and none to be equivalent. And so it's very easy for the gut to come up with um, wrong ideas about things, particularly in the management of risk. And much of what we're doing is risk management, as we're making trade-offs to try to approach perfection in a very imperfect practice. And the gut gets things wrong. And so managing the gut turns out to be an important part of what we do. Which brings us to JavaScript. So JavaScript is an amazing programming language. It was developed in about 10 days by Brendan Eich, who's a brilliant man. Uh, 10 days is way too short a time to develop and implement a programming language, uh, which is what he did. And his company, to its shame, released the language into the wild without ever having written enough code to determine if the language actually worked, uh, which was 
ridiculous, which is why there's no longer a Netscape. <laughs> but surprisingly, uh, so it's not surprising that there are bad parts in the language because it was never tested um, and there are a lot of really bad things in the language. The surprise is that there are good things in the language. Some of the most brilliant ideas in the history of programming languages found their way into this one. And so JavaScript is successful not because it was the language of the browser, it was actually the second language of the browser. It's successful because it worked. It, it, there is brilliance in this language and you can use that brilliance to write good programs. Um, now because it has these bad parts, the bad parts can really trip you up and, and it's hard to be perfect when you're building things out of bad parts. So to help myself in writing JavaScript, I wrote a program in JavaScript called JSLint, which um, understands the good parts. In fact, has taught me an enormous amount uh, about how the good parts work and, and what they are, um, and will identify the bad parts. And by conforming just to the good parts, you can write better programs. And it's available at jslint.com. Everybody's using it, right? Because everybody wants to be writing good programs. And it comes with a warning, JSLint will hurt your feelings. <laughs> and this is true, um, and I have felt it. I have felt JSLint's wrath, and, and I understand why I get the enormous number of letters that I do from people saying, JSLint hurt my feelings, you know, can you make it stop doing that? <laughs> um, and, you know, after a few years of that, I started to wonder, well, why is that? I mean, it's, it calls itself a code quality tool, so you're only, there's no, reason for you to use it except that you want to make your programs better. So you explicitly run it and, and it gives you a report and the idea is that you take advantage of its advice and it'll make your programs better. And instead people get angry and hurt and they start to cry. And, and why is that? And you know, why aren't they saying, oh, thank you, J.S. Lint, for pointing out that I could make things better in this way. And it has to do with the interaction between the gut and the head. So. And these questions can have an impact on programming style. Um, so you might have seen me talk about this before. Where, where does the curly brace go? Should it go on the left or on the right? When Ken Thompson designed the B language and then uh, Richie did the um, C language, they put them on the right. Just seemed like a place to go. But immediately there were people in their lab who said, no, they should go on the left. Uh, um, and I'm sure they argued about it for a couple of days and they, they decided, leave us out of this argument. We don't care. You know, put it, put it on whatever side you want. You know, this is a stupid argument. And it's a stupid argument because there is not a right answer. There is not a compelling reason for why one side should be preferred to the other. But something, there are some things everybody can agree on, is we should all be consistent. You should always put them on the same side because it looks stupid if you put them on the wrong side. And generally, you can get everybody to agree that everybody should do it the way you do it, right? I mean, you're doing it right, and everybody else is doing it wrong. Like, what's wrong with those people? Um, you know, so if you have someone who, who's always put them on the left, and he goes to work at a shop where you put them on the right, and people say, you've got to put them on the right now, he'll start to cry. And he'll start coming up with all these reasons for why that's wrong, it should go on the left, and the reasons don't make any sense at all because there's not a good reason to prefer, prefer one side to another, but there is a good re reason to be consistent. It's sort of like driving cars. There's not a good reason for why we should drive on the right or on the left, but there's a good reason for us to all be on the same side. <laughs> and this is kind of like that. Um, and Thompson and Ritchie did us a disservice in not picking a side. Um, and it's many, many decades later, and we still don't know what the right answer is. Um, except for JavaScript. And in JavaScript, there is a right answer, and that is you've got to put them on the right because sometimes you're going to have a return statement in which you're going to return the value of an object literal, and if you put the curly brace on the left, it will fail in the worst possible way. And that's a bad thing. So if you put the curly braces on the right, always, you will never experience this problem. And that's a nice problem to never experience. And the, if you look at it in terms of the trade-off, the cost of putting the curly brace on the right compared to put them on the left is zero. The benefit is there's this really nasty design error in JavaScript that you completely avoid. That's a nice trade-off. So um, prefer forms that are error resistant. Now, once after explaining this, I had someone come up to me and say, you know, from now on, on return statements, I'm always gonna put them on the right, but the rest of the time I'm gonna put them on the left. So, um, so JavaScript has a switch statement, 
This was copied after uh, B's switch statement, which was modeled after the Fortran computed go-to statement. Um, we determined that um, the go-to statement was harmful. Um, most of you are too young to remember that debate. We actually spent 20 years arguing about whether we should use go-to or not. It, it turned out we shouldn't. Um, and, and so we don't use it anymore, but it still survives in the switch statement. And there's a problem with the switch statement in that um, you can have one case which falls through into another case. And one day, I, um, in the early days of JSLint, someone wrote to me and said, you know, there's this hazard in the, in the switch statement. Sometimes a fall through is unintentional, but it's really hard to see it reading the code, and that can lead to errors. And I, wrote, I thought about it. I thought very deeply, and I wrote back and said, yeah, I've, I've seen that happen, but um, there's this really nice thing where if you can get all of your um, cases synchronized and they fall through into each other, it's like a waterfall, it's beautiful, and you've got this great thing, and it's so efficient and, and, and nice. And y yeah, I have seen the error, um, but it hardly ever happens, and so, but, and you get this other thing, so I think I'm not gonna warn about that. I think that's actually a good practice. The next day, the same guy wrote to me, and he said, I found a bug in JS Lint. I said, oh great, so I threw it in the debugger, and it turned out, yeah, you know where this is going. <laughs> I had a switch statement that was falling through. And in that moment, I achieved enlightenment. Because <laughs> it turns out, um, we're constantly making mistakes. That's what we do. We spend most of our time making mistakes and then trying to chase them down and correct them. We imagine we spend most of our time power typing. Oh, I'm typing in curly braces and semicolons and stuff. I'm getting work done. But no, we spend most of our time looking into the abyss, asking, my God, what have I done? <laughs> trying to make sense out of this puddle of confusion and turn it back into a working program. And somehow we black that out, because I think if we obsessed on that, we would, never, we would leave. That's one of the reasons I think why rational people don't do programming. <laughs> I used to think that everybody should learn programming. This is a, a, an amazing thing, you know, turning, teaching a machine how to do stuff. That teaches you so much about the world that you're living in. I used to think everybody should learn programming. I don't think that anymore. I think there needs to be something really seriously wrong with you in order to do programming. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I'm, um, this was an occasion where I could not ignore or, or black out the, the mistake that I had made. You know, it was so humiliating, so embarrassing that I had to recognize that I had made a fundamental mistake. You know, so what was my mistake? I said, that hardly ever happens, which is the way the gut says, it happens. Um, the gut's bad at arithmetic and will uh, get things like this fundamentally wrong. And so that becomes part of your working assumptions. And if you have any logical system in which you have false assumptions, then you can very easily get incorrect results. I and mean, we know that about logic. And that is how we work. Um, and so in order to achieve perfection, we need to be aware of our own processes and understand where our deeply held beliefs are coming from. Are they actually rational or are they based on false assumptions which um, are informed by the gut, which really doesn't understand what we're doing here. So a good style can help us produce better programs. Style should not be about personal preference or self-expression. We're not trying to be E.E. E. Cummings when we're writing programs. It should be about communicating clearly what the program is going to do, not just to the machine, but to ourselves. Because ultimately, um, if we don't understand what the program is doing, it's defective. So we can find examples of this in, in literary style. The Romans wrote Latin all in uppercase with no word breaks or punctuation. And they were able to read this stuff fine, um, even though there can be ambiguities. Like in the third line, you could read that as now or DB reeks. You know, so it's a little bit harder to parse this stuff to, to make sense out of it, but they were doing it. And this worked fine until Constantine established Christianity as the state religion of Rome, and they had a need to start sending holy texts all over the empire, uh, which meant they had to copy a lot of stuff. And they didn't have the originals. They had copies of copies of copies. And they found that no two copies agreed. Um, in fact, every time they made a copy, they introduced new errors. And this was a problem because they were now claiming their authority based on the word and nobody was sure what exactly the word was. 
Um, so uh, medieval copyists introduced uh, lowercase or minuscule word breaks and punctuation. And this turned out uh, to be very effective in helping reduce the error rate. Uh, it was so effective that Gutenberg adopted their conventions when he developed printing with movable type. And we still use it today. All writing uses these same conventions that were developed by these people in the Middle Ages because it works, because it makes text clearer. Um, and so there are conventions in the way we write which in no way limit our creativity. And the creativity in writing comes from choosing the right words and putting them in the right order. It's not about where you put the spaces around your punctuation. So good use of style can help reduce occurrence of errors. And that's true in, in writing, and I think it's also true in programming. Programmers must communicate clearly with people. Um, there are some programmers I've talked to who still don't understand this. They think that it's only about communicating with the machine. If they can convince the machine to do what they want to do, they've done their job. Um, but that's not true, particularly as we get more and more agile, as programs are never finished, um, and you can expect everything that you write will eventually be worked on by somebody else, uh, or possibly by future you who does not un remember why you did what you did in the first place it's much more important that the thing serve as a medium of communication to other human beings. So the elements of good composition um, can apply to programs as well as to written stuff. Uh, for example, in, in using commas, convention we've had for um, centuries is that you put the space after the comma, not before. Um, to the extent where that makes sense in programming languages, um, unless there's a compelling reason to do something else, I, I think that's a practice to continue. Uh, now, in some cases, uh, programming languages need to be much more precise than, than human languages. Uh, there have been attempts at, at creating programming languages which look like English, um, and mostly they fail just because they're not exact enough. So programming languages um, are different, but there are similarities. Um, but um, we, we introduce other kinds of ambiguities. We'll use parents in some cases as a uh, prefix operator in other cases as an infix operator. Um, and it's clearer if we're using parents to indicate um, invocation that uh, we use adjacency. And in all other cases, parents should not be adjacent with other text, with other letters. Um, and, and so that leads to style rules in order to help distinguish which things are function invocations and which things are not. Um, JavaScript has um, a width statement, which was intended to make it easier to, to get values from deeply nested um, objects. But it has a problem in its definition, um, and so should be avoided. So here I've got a width statement, and I will tell you that it will expand into one of these four statements in the box. Um, can anybody guess which one it's going to be? Yeah, it depends. There's not a correct answer. It's a trick question. It could be any of them. In fact, every time this statement executes, it could be a different one of them. So there's no way you can read a program that has width in it and be confident that you can predict what it's going to do. Um, that's just way too dangerous. Since I'm, I'm trying to be perfect and I'm trying to communicate well what my program does, constructs which cannot be correctly interpreted should be avoided. Now, there's some people who tell me, but width is so useful, you can do so many amazing things with it. And I, I agree that's true. I'm not saying it isn't useful. I'm saying there's never a case where it isn't confusing. And confusion must be avoided. We cannot be perfect when we're confused. JavaScript has this terrible um, double equal operator, which does type coercion. And because it does type coercion, it can get false positives. And that's a bad thing, because it makes it difficult to reason about programs. Fortunately, it has a triple equal operator, which always does the right thing. You don't get the false positives. So I recommend always use triple equal, never use double equal. Now, sometimes people will ask me, well, there's this occasion where double equal actually does exactly what I want. Um, should I use that in that case? And I recommend no, um, because the reader of the program is not going to know, um, did you choose the right operator in this case? Because most uses of double equal look like errors, and you don't want to be writing programs that, that look like errors. So I recommend never use double equal. It's just not worth it. 
If there is a feature of a language that is sometimes problematic and if it can be replaced by another feature that is more reliable, then always use the more reliable feature. This is a good trade-off. It comes at no cost. A, a new feature in JavaScript is multi-line string literals. Uh, this was something that was borrowed from other languages. I don't like this feature for a couple of reasons. One is it breaks indentation. The continuation has to start at the left margin, um, but usually we'll have text which is um, nested several levels because it's in blocks and functions and, and objects. And that nesting is important for understanding the structure of the thing that we're building, and that structure is broken by this statement. So I don't like this statement. Um, but also there is a syntactic hazard in it. So here we've got two statements. One of them is correct. The other is an obvious error. Can anybody spot the error? The yeah. The yeah, exactly. There's a space. It's obvious once it's pointed out. <laughs> but I don't want to be using forms that are indistinguishable from common errors. I want my programs to be more obviously correct, and so I don't use this. Avoid forms that are difficult to distinguish from common errors. Uh, JavaScript has, or all programming languages have scope. Scope controls the visibility and uh, longevity of variables. Scope is a really useful thing. Most languages have block scope. Um, JavaScript doesn't. JavaScript only has function scope. Now, it turns out you can write good programs just using function scope. Um, the problem with JavaScript is it has syntax which looks exactly like the syntax of block scoped languages. So people come to JavaScript from other languages, think that it has function or it has block scope. It doesn't. That can cause them to write things which will be uh, incorrect. So as a result of that, I recommend programming in JavaScript knowing that it does not have block scope, using techniques which favor a language that only has function scope. So declare all of your variables at the top of a function. Declare all of your functions before you call them. It turns out these things will happen anyway. So you might as well respect that so that the person who's going to read your program is more likely to correctly interpret what your program is going to do. Make your programs look like what they do. Um, the place that causes people the most difficulty is the induction variable on for loops. Uh, they, they might understand that they should put all the variables on top, um, but they, it, it's just too hard for this one. You know, I, I got to put the variable in the loop. Um, but it makes a program read wrong because the variable i is not scoped to the loop. It's scoped to the whole function. Um, so there are cases where you could have uh, nested loops which can interfere with each other. Or if you're uh, creating functions inside of the loop, um, they're going to uh, capture the wrong value of the variable. And that's a problem. Those are errors. Um, and the argument I, I get about uh, why you shouldn't rewrite this is, this is how I would write it in Java. I said, write in the language you're writing in. <laughs> now, someday JavaScript is going to have a let operator, which does respect block scope. And, and in that case, it, the the advice changes. Um, the advice would be declare your variables um, in the nested or in the innermost sc scope at the place where it's first used. That's good advice in a block scoped language. That's the worst advice in a function scoped language. So write in the right language. Um, I see stuff like this a lot, um, where um, one of the mistakes in the design of B and C was that it allowed for leaving the uh, uh, the curly braces out in the consequence of an if for a while. Um, and so a statement uh, like this um, looks like it means what the second line means, but it actually means what the third line means. So anytime you have a program which appears to be one thing but is actually another, that's an opportunity for introducing bugs. So my advice is always put the curly braces in. They make your program much more resilient. It's much easier for someone else who's going to have to maintain your program to understand how to modify it without breaking it. And the complaint I hear about that is, well, that costs two characters. And you have to go, ah, ah, that's so hard. <laughs> two characters cost nothing 
There's no cost in that. And the value is enormous. It makes your program much more resilient, much more likely that it's going to survive into the future. This is a really good trade-off. Always put the curly braces in. Um, as our processes become more agile, our coding must be more resilient. And putting the curly braces in does make your code more resilient. This one is really controversial. The plus plus operator was added to B and C in order to increment pointers. Uh, we have since uh, discovered that a pointer arithmetic is a bad thing, um, and so we don't see that in any modern languages except for C++, which was named after this misfeature. Um, <laughs> we, we still have plus plus, though, in all of our languages, um, and now it serves the purpose of adding one to a variable which is not a, a big deal. Um, there's a, another form called plus equal one, which does the same thing, which costs one extra character. Um, so plus plus has been implicated in buffer overruns and other security hazards. Uh, the, one of the problems with it is, um, I, I know a problem with it in my own practice is, if I'm using plus plus, I cannot resist trying to squeeze as much as possible into one statement. I'll try to take a whole function's worth of code and just squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until I get it into one statement. And that turns out to be about the stupidest thing you can do. Because um, looking at it in terms of trade-offs, the uh, benefit of having squeezed all that code into one statement, there is no benefit to that. Um, and the cost is enormous because your code is now much more complicated, much more difficult to understand, much more likely to be disguising security bugs. Um, I do not trust myself to use this operator because if I ever use it once, then I start doing that and I start making really bad choices. So I always use plus equal one, never the other. And I hear people complain about that. Like, I should be able to write x plus plus because it means exactly the same thing and it's one character less and, and like, that's important. And it's not important. And not only that, it's wrong because it's not equivalent to um, plus equal one, plus plus x is equivalent to plus equal one. So whenever I see a program in which these things are being used interchangeably, I have to wonder, does this guy know the difference between pre-increment and post-increment? And I have to look at every plus plus in his program and ask, did he get it wrong? Because it's a really easy transposition to get wrong, and it produces a really subtle off by one error. I can't have any confidence in the code, so reading that code becomes much more difficult. Recently, I was re reviewing something, and I saw this. Uh, now, if the original code had said plus equal one, it would have been really easy to change it to plus equal two. But it was originally um, plus plus x, so he added another one. I think, or maybe it was just a copy-paste error. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what he was trying to do. Um, all I know is it looks stupid, and it's probably wrong. So for no cost, by adopting a more rigorous style, many classes of errors can be automatically avoided. And so here's another common error. Um, the, uh, we've got the first statement, um, which looks like the third statement, but actually does what the second statement does. Um, it, again, you don't want to be using forms which look like common errors. Um, this is something I see in JavaScript. The, it, pretty much all the problems we've seen up until now are, are common to all of the C languages. The, um, with and, and this one are unique to JavaScript. Um, so I've seen people using this thinking it means what the second line says, but it actually means what the third line says. So if I see this in a program, the only thing I know for sure is that the programmer was incompetent. But beyond that, trying to understand what he intended to do, I'm not sure. Um, so I recommend avoiding these kinds of ambiguous forms. Write in a way that clearly communicates your intent. Programming is the most complicated thing that humans do. Uh, computer programs must be perfect, and humans are not good at perfect. Um, so um, designing a programming style d demands discipline. It's not selecting features because they're liked or pretty or familiar or shiny. It's choosing features because they will reduce our error rate. Because ultimately, that's the only thing that matters. 
Um, the JS Lint style was driven by the need to automatically detect errors. Um, I, when I started JS Lint, I had no idea where the program was going to go. Um, but over the years, it has taught me a, an enormous amount about JavaScript and about programming style. Um, in looking at the forms that were available in the language and trying to determine um, if they were being used correctly. Um, there are many um, forms in JavaScript which can be used correctly, but uh, often are used incorrectly. And I tried to figure out the difference, and I couldn't. I could not find automatic rules which told me when with was being used well, when eval was being used well. So ultimately, I was forced to conclude that forms that can hide defects should themselves be considered defects, because ultimately, we're trying to get the defects out. So there will be bugs. Uh, there will always be bugs. I'm not promising that I can eliminate all bugs. What I'm trying to do is shave the odds in your favor. Um, anything we can do to reduce our error rates will make us more effective in what we do. So the approach I've taken with JSLint is language subsetting. Uh, it's been said only a madman would use all of C++. It can also be said only a madman would use C++. I'm not going to debate that point this morning, um, despite its obvious uh, truthiness. <laughs> yeah. So in conclusion, uh, good style is good for your gut. Thank you and good night. So I think we have a few minutes for questions, so if you can raise your hand and, and shout it out, and I'll try to repeat your question. Yeah. Yeah, so what do I think about JavaScript being the assembly language for the web? This was a role we never anticipated. Um, I, I, I don't call it the assembly language, I call it the virtual machine of the web, but you know, essentially the same thing. I always thought the virtual machine of the web was going to be the Java virtual machine. Um, but we're now finding that Google is translating Java into JavaScript so it can run everywhere. Wow, that, that, that's amazing. And so there's now pressure on JavaScript to be a better platform for a, a better compilation target. Um, and so we're trying to do that without compromising the language for its intended purposes. So let me, let me give you an example of one of the uh, trade-offs we're looking at. JavaScript has a small set of, of um, loop and, and structured programming uh, things like if and while and for. If you, if you have a language which has a different set of controls than JavaScript, it's really hard to translate your program into JavaScript or to, to translate it effect, uh, efficiently. Um, so there's been interest in adding go to to the language so that you could then synthesize your own control operators. And that would make so much sense if all it's intended to be is um, a, a target language. Um, what I'm certain will happen is that any time we put a bad feature into the language, people will find it. The problem with bad features isn't that they're useless, it's that they're dangerous. They're all too often useful. Uh, so someone will tweet somewhere, hey, I put a go-to in my program and it's going faster. And then suddenly all the geeks are going to start putting go-to in their program. It took us 20 years to get rid of it the first time. Um, and it would take us another 20 years to get rid of it again. Uh, we don't want to be responsible for that. We're, um, we're trying to, to move things forward. Um, so there's always going to be this tension between JavaScript as a language itself, which is actually a brilliant language, and people should learn how to use it. And then the people who don't want to learn how to use it and would rather be using a different language, but because their language isn't popular, um, they have to turn into JavaScript so they can run it everywhere. It, you know, so it, it's hard and we're going to have to deal with that. Another example is um, uh, integers. JavaScript got integers right, which is basically, it, there's an error in almost all programming languages that if you have two numbers which are greater than zero and add them together, you can get a result which is smaller than either of those numbers. That's insane. But, you know, Fortran had it, C has it, Java has it, C Sharp has it, and but mostly people haven't figured out that's a stupid thing. Um, and so they want us to have it. Um, there are people who want to convert C Sharp into JavaScript. And there are errors in C Sharp pro programs because of the wrapping around of integers. And they'd like us to be able to easily and efficiently replicate those errors 
when they get translated into JavaScript. Yeah, and I don't know. So it's, it's, it's hard to be ahead of the pack. I mean, there are a couple of places where JavaScript is smarter than the other languages, and there's this pressure on JavaScript to get dumbed down in order to make it more like everything else. Uh, one last question. Uh, yeah. What's my uh, take on JS Hint? So JS Hint is a version of JS Lint uh, which allows you to turn off more and more of the warnings. Um, there are a lot of stupid people in the world, and I think it's great that there's a tool like that for them. <laughs> okay, so that's it. I'm out of time. <laughs>